Not all units of a pricing metric are usually worth the same. And the customer will tend to focus on the economics at the unit level, while you, the SaaS vendor, will tend to focus on the economics on the customer level. This is the fourth video in my series on pricing metrics. The first three were on operational viability, on value, and on expectation to pay. So we wrap that up now with the concept of metric density, which is an important one in terms of how well your pricing metric is going to monetize overall. Here's what it does. Let me give you an example. Stripe charges a percentage of the total amount being transacted in the payment, right? So they will charge you 2.95 percentage points out of every dollar and cent that moves through their payment terminal. If you have a low volume, that percentage will be lower. But in any case, they charge a percentage of the gross merchant value. Now, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. So one dollar is worth exactly the same to you as the next dollar and the third dollar, which means that the value that Stripe provides in terms of that one transaction or, or processing of the payment of that dollar is worth the same to you as the other one. They're totally uniform, which means that from a density perspective, the pricing metric that Stripe has, percentage of gross merchant value, is super dense. Let me give you another example. I'm working with an insure tech out of Switzerland that provides a system that operates between pharma companies, insurers, and hospitals, healthcare providers, hospital systems. They bring value to their end customers in this ecosystem on a patient level. So they proposed charging per patient, charging the insurers per patient that was being processed through the system. Using their system, on average, an insurer would be able to save about $20 per patient. So if they had a million patients, they would be able to save $20 million. So these are big money and worth sort of an enterprise solution to get into motion. The insure tech that I work with had the following logic. Well, if the insurer saves $20, we will be able to charge a percentage of that as our price point using patients as our pricing metric. My counter question to them was, well, is every patient worth $20? And the answer is, well, no. Out of a million patients, about 700,000 of them are worth zero because we can't optimize anything on those. And a very few of the patients, a couple of dozen, are worth more than a million. So they are of a very high value because we optimize payments for very expensive treatments that the insurers have to pay and so forth. But the average comes out of 20. Okay, so the median value, so if you rank all the values of patients from the largest one, which is a million, to the bottom one, which is zero, then if you go in the middle, it's actually zero because 70% of all the patients had zero added value to them. This is an issue. And it became an issue when they were taking this model to their customers, the insurance companies, because the insurance companies would look at their 1 million patients and say, well, if we paid you $2, let's say, per patient on all of the patients, we would actually lose $2 per patient on these 700,000 patients, which really isn't offset by the fact that we would make $999,998 on the last patient, on the top patient. So what the insurers were beginning to do before we fixed this issue was to just try to sort all their patients and say, well, can we send them every patient except the 700,000, so they would start to divert the flow. So instead of sending them 1 million patients, which charged at $2 per patient would be worth $2 million to the insurance tech I work with, the insurer were now trying to say, well, let's just send them 300,000. So you get less of the volume and 300,000 would be $600,000. So suddenly we have a monetization issue where we only get 30% of the volume that we had otherwise intended, even though on an average basis, our price points stands really good in comparison to the average value of that unit that we're pricing by. So this is the concept of metric density, which is how does the average value of whatever unit you're pricing by in your, your pricing metric stack up against the median value of that unit that you're pricing by? In the Stripe example, it's dollars. So the average value of a dollar is precisely the median value of a dollar, which is a dollar. So you have perfect density. But in the patient example I just gave, well, the average value is 20, while the median value was zero. So there you have a large discrepancy. And what will happen psychologically is that the customer will tend to focus on the individual unit and the economics of that unit and make sure that every transaction on that unit makes sense to them and they aren't, let's say, 
cheated or treated unfairly or doing something that they would regret if they had done otherwise. So from the SaaS vendor perspective, we tend to focus on the economics of the customer base and say, well, if they just buy the solution wholesale, it will make sense for them. But we have to realize when designing our pricing models that the customer does not think that way. They think of it on a metric unit level, the unit that we're pricing them. By. When evaluating the metric density of a given pricing metric that you have. And earlier we used the example in the AI for banks uh, where we said, well, okay, uh, models perhaps are a good pricing metric. How would that work? We had the HR flow that I talked about, I think in the last or previous video on where recruiters would process surveys and forms and get information on potential candidates and they would fill positions. And here we had a metric, something like number of candidates processed or enriched with new data. And we can sort of try to see how these would stack up on a density basis. And the important thing to notice when looking at a value distribution in a pricing metric are to ask yourself the question, is the value that I'm looking at distributed, say, roughly like a bell curve, which means that you have a lot of value on a few units, and then you have a very few extreme cases with a lot of value and a very few extreme cases with not a lot of value. But generally you see sort of, you know, they, they lump together in the middle. Most of them are of some value. You will see that, for example, which is often the case with users. So if you have, if you're selling Microsoft Word or the Microsoft Office package. Could you argue that all users are worth the same? Well, no. Some of the users are going to be better at using Excel and Word than other users, right? But is the value discrepancy really that large, right? Some of them are going to be worthless. They, they can't spell, they can't, you know, use any of their formulas in Excel, so they're going to be worth very little. But by and large, the users tend to have roughly the same value. And even though you have a few extreme outliers to either end, ones that are worthless and ones that are worth a lot because they're really power users, we can sort of aggregate that value around a bell curve formula with not a lot of fat tails. In it. So if you have something like that, usually you would have to look at the average and the mean would be very close to that average, maybe a little less, maybe even a little above. But in a bell curve formula, the average and the mean tends to be sort of similar. Sometimes you can have the average moved away from the mean because you have a lot of value in the really high outlier cases. But essentially, if you have a bell curve distribution, you can't really price that value unless you focus in on it in your product and productize and package around those specific use cases specifically. So otherwise that value is lost if you provide a generic solution that captures all of the units that you have in the bell curve that you're modeling. So bell curve distribution of value in a pricing metric, like it usually is with users, tends to give you sort of at the middle average, maybe a little bit below as a good starting point for the value that your customer will consider being delivered with each unit. So you have to have a fraction of that and so forth. But the math comes out pretty easily. The customer will never really feel cheated on any of the particular instances and so forth. Take that and contrast it to power law distributed value. So the patient example I gave before is a power law distributed value where a few patients have a value of a million and a lot of patients have a value of a zero, which means that the majority of the value sits in a very few percentage points of the population that we're measuring with this pricing metric. In these cases, it can be really, really difficult to make a pricing metric work without doing specifications of the metric in terms of, well, you're not really paying for all the ones without the value, so you might as well get them into the flow and so forth. I had an example also the other day with a subscription management system for newspapers where free subscribers, for example, were part of the metric, but because they tend to move the average and the mean so far away from the average and mean when we only consider the paying subscribers in some form, we decided to give them away for free. Because if we had to charge per subscriber all in, paid and free, we would have to charge a number so low because the newspapers would feel cheated for paying for free subscribers. So that is why we defined that pricing metric in that example with the free subscribers out of the definition of the metric. So these are kind of the things that you have to do in order to figure out that the population you're measuring is distinct enough and the value is concentrated enough for you to really measure and measure in a way where you're customer will feel that you're measuring it fairly and the average and mean are so close to each other that you actually get to use it as a reference point 
for your price point. So this is metric density in a nutshell. And it's one of the things that most people miss because if you, you can have a really valuable pricing metric. So the insured tech pricing metric with pricing per patient is valuable. Insurers get it, they understand it, they think it's fair. So it also has expectation to pay. They can see how you know the insured tech costs are driven by processing patients. It's a good measurement. It's, it's something they used to pay by. They actually want more patients run through the system and so forth. So everything stacks out from a value perspective and from an expectation to pay perspective. It also is operationally viable. It can be measured and so forth, built. But on a density basis, we run into issues. And the density basis really is where the ability to monetize comes in. Because if we run it with something like this as is in the insured tech case, what will happen is that they will do two things, the customers. One is they will not give you all of that flow. So that's the example I gave before. They will not give you 70% of the flow because it's worth nothing to them. And the other thing is that they will try to get you to discount the remaining flow that they send you because, well, even though the value is really high uh, in some of them, they will feel that for every case that they are overpaying for, if they have a lot of cases of $1 and $2, they don't want to pay $1 and $2 for them. They would want you to give a generalized discount to make it worth their while on an individual unit basis. So you have these two motions with the customer where they're trying to fit your solution in a way that enables them to rest in their decision, knowing that they're not going to regret it. And they're going to try to either reduce volume or reduce price to figure out a settlement point with you where they are at rest, right? Both of those things you don't want. So you have a couple of options here is to either just pick another pricing metric, right? That's the first option. Just saying, okay, this metric that I had per patient doesn't really work. I'm going to take a measurement of the dollar save. So if we do that with the insured check, instead of pricing per patient, but pricing per dollar saved, we might suddenly have a very uniform and dense metric to price by, which is great. It might not have the same expectation to pay, but okay, so we have a trade-off. But now you get to see all the moving parts that you have in selecting your pricing metric and what goes into that. So the technical measurement of metric density goes as follows. Median value of a patient, let's say that's $10 in this example, divided by the average value of a patient, whatever pricing metric you're using. So let's say that's $20. So if 10 divided by 20 is 0.5, right? Multiplied by the amount of units in the population on a percentage basis that sits above the median. So let's say that, well, all of the units, or let's say that 70% of the units sit above the median. So you have a $10 median and you have a $20 average So that's 0.5 and 70% of all the units in the population sits above those $10. Is $10 or more worth, okay. So you take 0 0.5 and you multiply it by 70%, so 0.7, so you get 0.35, right? So usually density, there are some edge cases where it can go above one, but usually density comes out as a measurement between zero and one. So if you do Stripe, for example, well, their average value is one and their median value is one, so that's one. And how many of their units, the dollars that they process sits at or above one? Well, 100%. So one times 100% is one. So Stripe has perfect density. So usually you can tranche it like this. If your metric density using this measurement and don't get lost in the math, like do it roughly, but try to do the exercise. Usually if your metric density sits at, at a quarter or less, 0.25 or less, you have poor monetization potential from this and you're really going to struggle. If it sits between a quarter and a half, so between 0.25 and 0.5, it could work, but you need really good packaging. You need really good sort of value proposition in the product that you're buying to move it by. So it's not unworkable. You see like high growth companies at this level of density, but usually they will be forced to do some of the discounting or not get all the volume and so forth. But if they have a strong product and a strong product market fit, especially in their packaging, it, it can work. At 0.5 to 0.75, you have really strong density and the monetization potential starts to be so strong that you can even get away with not having good packaging, right? So even though Stripe could get away with not having good packaging because the monetization potential and the willingness to pay on the unit level is so high that they really get to capture a lot of the value in the unit, the dollar transaction that they're doing. So at, at a half to three quarters, it starts to, to work the other way around where metric density really sort of helps you. And that becomes really apparent at three quarters to one where density is 
close to perfect and you have really, really good monetization and you can start to even slag a little bit on everything else. So metric density is a concept I invented. I think it captures a lot of the goings on in psychological mechanisms in pricing metrics that should otherwise work, that have really good value and demand that track something well and has sort of good expectations to pay and fairness and cost transparency and all these things and it's operationally viable. But sometimes you just see it put into action and that it doesn't work. And usually it doesn't work because it has low density. So this is my fourth measurement on things you need to check when selecting a pricing metric. The three videos before will explain the other three. In the next video, the last one in this series, I'm gonna go through how to run this exercise, how to actually sort of take you know, inventory of the potential pricing metrics and evaluate them and finally select one. So stay tuned for that. Okay, take care.